Um, the third component of the circulatory system that we're looking at would be the blood. And, and the blood has a, a pretty significant histology aspect to that. Um, and so this little video here is going to focus on that, the blood. Um, it's important to remember that, that blood is a connected tissue, and, and therefore, like the other connected tissues that we've been learning about, there, there should be a cellular component, and then there's this non-living extracellular matrix, which in the case of blood is the blood plasma. And so if you think about a sample of blood, roughly 55% of that blood is just blood plasma. It, it's, it's primarily just water with some proteins and other sort of molecules involved. So really only about 45% of our blood is actually cellular. And, and more important, of that 45%, almost all of it, roughly 44 of the 45% are going to be red blood cells or urethrocytes. And so really, although this, this video here is, is going to seem to focus on the white blood cells a lot, the truth is white blood cells as a whole make up less than 1% of that blood. Um, and so as you are looking at slides, just realize that most of what you see are going to be the white or are the red blood cells, the erythrocytes, and that the white blood cells themselves are going to be often very difficult to find. And some of these are so, so infrequent that, that you may have to look through multiple slides to find them. And so keep an eye on the actual labels on the slides. Some of them may have very specific labels suggesting that there's a good chance you're going to find those. Um, and so what I have here, this is a figure out of your textbook, and, and this is showing the five different white blood cells or leukocytes that you're going to be expected to identify and know functions for in lab. And so you can see here that they're first broken up using um, um, a, a description that involves the granulocyte and the agranulocytes. And really what that means is these top three are cells that have very prominent stained granules within their cytoplasm. And those granules become very nice defining, distinguishing features for these three. And then the other two, as we'll see, are the A granulocytes. And these don't have really prominent granules within their cytoplasm. And so the first thing when you look at a slide and you find some white blood cells is ask yourself, are there obvious granules? And if so, then it's going to be one of these three granulocytes. And if not, then it's likely to be one of the two A granulocytes down below. You'll notice within the granulocytes, the different colors for the granules, that's going to be very important. On the right over there, we have the basophils. They tend to have very blue, dark granules. Whereas at the top, we have these eosinophils, and these tend to have very orange, almost reddish granules. Right? Those two should be easy to tell apart based on the colors of the granules. And then on the top left, we have neutrophils, and they have a very neutral or kind of brownish gray color granule. Whereas on the bottom, the, really the big thing that you'll notice there is, is the size of the cell and, and the um, amount of the cell occupied by the nucleus. On the bottom left, we have lymphocytes, and those tend to have really large nuclei, almost taking up a majority of the cytoplasm there. Whereas on the right, we have monocytes. These, these are very large cells relative to the others, and they have this sort of almost kidney bean or C-shaped nucleus. And so as we go through some of these slides here, I'll try to point those characteristics out again. But, but those tend to be very good features to use to be able to distinguish between these five different white blood cells. And so in this slide here, we, we, I'm showing you two different white blood cells. Now again, as I go back, make sure you recognize that most of the cells in this field of view are actually red blood cells. So all of these cells here, these kind of pink donut shaped cells, these are the red blood cells or the urethrocytes. And, and the reason why they have this sort of donut-like shape is because they have what's described as a biconcave shape, meaning that the center is actually thinner than the edges. And so if you think about a light microscope, the light that's coming through the center, more of it can penetrate, and so it tends to be lighter, whereas less of the light can penetrate the thicker outer area, which is feeling sort of donut-like. Um, just as a reminder, this should be reviewed, but red blood cells are the ones that are filled with hemoglobin, they're the ones that are transporting oxygen. Um, they, as mature cells, they do not have nuclei. They lack the organelles that we often associate with cells. During development, they have those organelles, but as they become mature and fully functioning, they lose those features. And so we don't see any nuclei within these red blood cells because they do not have any. But if we turn our attention back to these two white blood cells here, we'll notice that they're different. Um, and, and, and really the thing that should jump out is the color of their granules. So hopefully you see that both of them have really prominent granules within their cytoplasm. Um, on the left here, these granules are really dark blue and purple. And, and the truth is that almost masks the nuclei. So this cell doesn't even appear to have nuclei because of how 
prominent in masking those dark blue granules are. This is a basophil. And so basophils are actually the least common of all of these. And so you may have a very difficult time finding a good basophil. So realize that when you're looking for one, they are very, very, very difficult to find just because of how, it, how, how low a frequency they are naturally within blood. Um, basophils, they are involved in an immune response, an inflammatory response. Um, and so all of these white blood cells have some immune role. The basophils in particular um, are, are capable of, of producing and releasing histamine and other molecules like heparin. And as we've learned about before, those are involved in the inflammatory response, so allergies. On the right here, we have the granulocyte that has that red or orange granule. And this one is the eosinophils. And these eosinophils, these um, are, are a little bit more common than the basophils, but they're still not the most frequent white blood cell you'll see. And so you may have a difficult time finding these, but the red-orange granules tends to make them stand out compared to the others. Um, these eosinophils, they, they tend to be involved in um, um, allergies, so response to allergies as well. They have a role in the inflammatory response. They're also associated with parasitic worms. And so we, we definitely find a correlation with individuals that, that are um, fighting off, I guess, parasitic worm infections are going to have much higher levels of these eosinophils. So here are the two of the three granulocytes. On the right, eosinophil, the orange-red, and on the left, the basophil, the kind of the purple-blue granules. In this view, we, we can see here on the left, uh, one of those eosinophils. Now, the, 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 the light, the, the red-orange may not be as obvious as it was on earlier ones, um, but when you compare these granules within this cytoplasm to then the ones over here, we do see that this definitely has an orange or redder look to it. So this is another one of those eosinophils. And you can see, again, most of what we see here are red blood cells within, in this case, only two white blood cells within this field of view. The other one we see here, this is the third of those granulocytes, and this is the neutrophil. It turns out neutrophils are the most common white blood cell. And so most of the white blood cells, roughly 70% of the white blood cells you see are going to be these neutrophils. And neutrophils tend to have a very classic lobed, multi-lobed nucleus. And so you'll notice this nucleus almost looks like it has three different parts. This is one nucleus that's just got these different lobes. And if you look very closely, there's these very thin strands that actually connect these lobes. And so the neutrophils tend to not have really, really obvious granules, but they have this very classic multi-lobed nucleus. Here, this next view, we can see four neutrophils along the top here. Again, really, really, really obvious in terms of how they have these very odd multi-lobed nuclei with these little thin filaments connecting them. So that's a very nice classic example of the nuclei, which becomes a defining feature for these neutrophils. Neutrophils are, are actually pretty short-lived phag phagocytic cells. And so neutrophils are, are one of our phagocytic cells. They're going to phagocytize um, foreign objects, particularly bacteria. Um, and, and because of that activity, they tend to be very short-lived. And so we tend to have a lot of them. Again, roughly 70% of our white blood cells are going to be neutrophils. So those three represent our granulocytes. The orange-red, eosinophil, really dark blue that almost mask the nucleus or the basophils. And then here, the ones that don't seem to have a really, really obvious set of granules, but really distinct multi-lobe nuclei. These tend to be um, identified as the neutrophils. You'll notice that there's a lot of variation. So I'm trying to show some really good examples of each, but, but you will likely find yourself frustrated at times looking at, at some of these slides because of how much variation actually exists between and within these different types of cells. Sometimes it's like, oh, is, that a, is that a neutrophil or is that something else? And sometimes it's very difficult to say. And so just remember that on, on exams, ultimately we're going to be expecting you to know sort of the classic examples. We're not going to try to set up one that's, that's potentially both ways um, as a way to trick you. The other two cells here that you can see at the bottom of this field of view, these are now representing one of those agranulocytes. These are the smaller lymphocytes. And so you remember when I mentioned the lymphocytes briefly earlier, they're the ones that have the cell that's primarily the nucleus, right? You can see only a very thin kind of halo of cytoplasm surrounding this nucleus. So these, these lymphocytes tend to also be pretty um, easy to identify. They're smaller. You'll notice that they're only a little bit larger than the red blood cells. Sometimes it's nice to use red blood cells as, as a reference. 
right? These neutrophils, the, these are significantly larger than the red blood cells, whereas these lymphocytes, they're just a little bit larger and they have a really, really obvious large circular nucleus. These lymphocytes, um, later on, we're going to learn more about the B cells and the T cells. Those are just different types of lymphocytes. We cannot tell them apart visually. So there's no way for us to say if this is a B lymphocyte or a T lymphocyte. At this point, we just want to be able to recognize those as lymphocytes. And at this point, know that lymphocytes are involved in our immune response. Um, some of them are involved in producing antibodies and others are involved in, in um, activating some of our adaptive immune response. So we're going to get into the specific roles of these different lymphocytes later on. Um, but at this point, just be able to identify them and distinguish from some of the other white blood cells that we see here. In this field of view, we, we actually see a few different white blood cells here. And so just as a review, here's one of those lymphocytes. This one's a little bit larger than we saw, but it's, it's a lymphocyte. Here we have a neutrophil with that very distinct multi-lobed uh, lobed nucleus. And then the other cell here, much, much, much larger, has a very sort of distinct kidney-shaped or C-shaped nucleus. And up here, this is an insert from another figure, but just wanted to isolate it. Here's another one of those cells, much, much, much larger, maybe twice the size of a red blood cell with this very nice C-shaped or kidney bean-shaped nucleus. These are the monocytes. And so the monocytes would be the other type of a granulocyte we're going to find. And these monocytes, they, they are macrophages. So they're going to also be involved in phagocytizing. Um, they tend to be much longer lived than the neutrophils, um, and they're also going to be involved in helping activate other parts of our immune system as well. And so these macrophages, as well as the neutrophils, are both phagocytic cells. Um, beyond that, there are a lot of actually differences between how they do that um, but the point for, again, us today is be able to identify, distinguish the five different white blood cells, and then understand a very simple function for each. And so beyond these white blood cells, we also have you identify um, megakaryocytes. And so this, these two slides here, these are different slides, um, both of bone marrow, so both of red bone marrow. And it turns out that in addition to the white blood cells, in addition to the red blood cells, there are also platelets. There are also these, these cellular fragments that we will find within blood. And the platelets are really important in blood clotting. And so the, the role of platelets in our blood is to help with the clotting. And it turns out that, that again, platelets are not cells. They're, they're little cell fragments. And those cell fragments form from these very large cells that you'll find in bone marrow. And so on the right here, using the stain, these turn out that really large purple nuclei, right? To give you a reference point, all of these little dots throughout here, these are developing blood cells. These could be red blood cells, they could be some of the white blood cells, but you notice how small those cells are relative to this size. So this is a large cell. This is a megakaryocyte. Here's another one, right? These are significantly larger than all of the other little blood cells around them. These megakaryocytes, these are the cells that will break off fragments of themselves to form these platelets. On the left here, just using a different stain, here is a megakaryocyte with a very, very, very large nucleus. Right, here's another one down here, here's one. And again, as reference, all these other small dots here, these are developing white blood cells and red blood cells within this red bone marrow. And so you should be able to identify these megakaryocytes. They tend to be really obvious. They just stand out as significantly larger cells compared to all the other ones. Again, we have to recognize the scale here. All of these cells were looking much larger on our previous slides because of the magnification. They're really small here so that we can really recognize the difference between the megakaryocytes, the large cells, the ones that produce the platelets versus all the other ones. And so here, this is a slide we looked at earlier, and we could use this to identify red blood cells. We could use it to identify this one, which is a lymphocyte. But I wanted to point out the platelets. And so the other thing that you'll often find within these blood smears are these small little fragments, these little purple fragments. And these are those platelets that I mentioned. These are small little cellular fragments. These are not entire cells. They are derived from those megakaryocytes. And these are those platelets that are involved in blood clotting.